Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ina St. Jean, for those of you who don't know me, and I am a board member of the St. John Valley Senior College as a monitor, and Helen Neto was our greeter today as a monitor uh, for this class, Spruce Budworm. I would, like to, I would like to let you know about the next class that will be presented by Dave Hobbins. The one thing I'd like to remind you of is that it is a Zoom class, okay? And I believe it's on April 5th. Let me check. Oh, I might have it, Helen. Yeah. Yes, April 5th at 7 o'clock, okay? And uh, now I would like to introduce you to our pres presenter this evening uh, in reference to our spruce budworm class, Dr. Neil Thompson. And thank you, thank you <laughs> for him. <laughs> and I'll give you just a very short, uh, brief bio. Dr. Neil Thompson is the Irving Woodlands Forestry Professor at UMFK. He is a Maine native who received his PhD from the University of Northern British Columbia and his BS in Forestry from UMaine. In addition to being the Forester, Forester Program Coordinator and teaching half-time here at this university, his responsibilities include research for cooperative forestry research units for spruce budworm, L2 population, and defoliation survey in Maine. Another project includes long-term stream monitoring geared towards uh, predicting stream temperatures and flow and regimes for headwater streams in northern Maine. Dr. Neal looks after both greenhouses on campus and informal research includes a plantation of American chestnut. That interested me though. In the Fournay Bio Park and a collection of 180 plus nest boxes for songbirds ducks, native solitary bees, and bats placed around the campus and Fort Kent. I guess we'll have to search for them. <laughs> <laughs> so with that having been said, I'll pass it on to you, Doc. Well, thank you so much for being here for that introduction. So first of all, I'm sure you've all been captivated by our unfortunate budworm here. This is a budworm attempting to pupate and grow into a moth, and this is the larva of an eye-spotted eye lady beetle. And that is uh, having that for breakfast. <laughs> that is in a stand in uh, Fort Kent. Unfortunately, I only found four of the lady beetles and found hundreds to thousands of the budworm, but that one made a pretty good picture. So today I want to give you a bit of an overview of spruce budworm and where it lives in the context of our overall forest landscape and in the context of other forest pests, other diseases, other stresses that we've been experiencing. We see budworm in our forests today, but we also see a lot of other things that are turning the trees red. And the first question I get, is this because of budworm? The answer is more often than not, no. So I want to give you a bit of an overview of that whole structure. I can pretty well skip that slide, but uh, <laughs> thank you for not uh, pointing that out right off. I could be run out of town on a rail here, but if you'll, if you'll forgive me for that, I will continue. <laughs> Uh-oh. So my PhD was University of Northern British Columbia on the drought tolerance of the Douglas fir from a very dry part of the world where a tree of this diameter, this one dates back to 1535. So if you care to inspect that later on, this is a recorder tree with five or six different uh, wildfires recorded in its history. So that's one of my samples from my PhD work. And come to find out that when you have a bit of space between the canopies of the trees, more rainfall can reach the soil where the roots have access to it. And that helps them uh, to 
survive the droughts. And the question that I was asking was in the context of mule deer wintering range, in the same way that we have deer yards, they call them wintering range, but they like to manage their Douglas fir in clumps to keep some of the snow off the ground in the same way we do here. And there was some concern that that clumpiness might uh, cause some issue with the Douglas fir beetle, which is what killed this. And the answer to the question is no, that as long as the tree has some access to growing space on one side or two sides, that's enough. And in terms of its resilience through drought, that was equal in terms of its reduction during the drought and recovery afterwards. So that's good news for all involved. I also found that natural canopy gaps formed by the natural death of competing trees had the same effect. I found scars from the Douglas fir beetle. I don't have any on this particular sample, but they leave a characteristic scar. I found and dated those back into the 1800s, giving evidence that that insect has been there for a very long time. I did not find evidence in the tree rings of western spruce budworm outbreaks, which would show as a reduction in growth in the host species, not matched by a reduction in growth in another species that is not affected by that pest. What that indicates is that western spruce budworm, which recently had a very large outbreak in that region, is a newcomer and has moved up since conditions have become more favorable to it. And we've since had some uh, modeling work done based on temperature that says in the temperature that was recorded 100 years ago up until recently, it was not suitable for it to finish its life cycle and mature. And now with the current temperature regime, it is. So unfortunately, we have a bit of a new Newcomer to that part of the world. Uh, since uh, Jeff Dubas left, I'm sure many of you know or knew Jeff. He's uh, doing well over in uh, New York with the Ranger Schools program, and he left me a very nice office. So I took over the leadership of the forestry program over the summer, unexpectedly, and more expectedly took over the uh, leadership of the Cooperative Forestry Research Unit, which is an association of landowners ranging from the Seven Islands, Weyerhaeuser, Irvings of the world, to the Nature Conservancy, Baxter State Park, and others, all of whom pool their money in a voluntary tax based on their acreage in to a fund that goes to researchers in applied research, usually out of UMaine. But since a lot of people got to know me through Budworm and got to know the campus through Budworm, they asked me to take over leadership when the previous leader took another position. So I'm about ooh, six to eight months into that, and that's been going very well for us so far, but it does keep me busy. So I want to put all of this in the context of the forest and how it's developed over the last uh, century and a half since our uh, grandparents or great-grandparents showed up and uh, started working here. But this data goes back to 1982, and this is from the uh, Federal uh, Forest Inventory data, which is done periodically. And this is looking at the uh, amount of acreage in each size class of spruce and fir from the 1980s through 2013. The 1980s was in the middle of the last spruce butterm outbreak. And in the middle of that outbreak, we had about 4 million acres of the large diameter spruce and fir forest type. That declined and has slightly declined since by 1995. So we've lost about half of our large diameter spruce and fir. We've had a decline in the medium diameter as well and some increase in the small diameter, but not enough to match the loss in the larger diameter stands. What that implies is that about one and a half million acres of spruce and fir has been converted to something else. And we'll look at what that something else is very shortly. But these two maps from the same document here, Maine Forest 2013, look at the total volume in each of those uh, species. This one, I believe, is red spruce. So this is where the most of the red spruce volume is. That purple color is high, down to low here. Less red spruce down here. There's Baxter. And this area here has the greatest volume of red spruce. This farming area here and here, of course, has less. And we can see a decline from the 80s to now, especially in the northern region. And then balsam fir, which is our star of the show here, has volume spread throughout the uh, state of Maine, especially in the county, and also especially along the Maine coast, which is a favorable location for it. But we've had a reduction in the volume of that species too. What happened to those acres? 
Since the 1980s, this is the shade tolerant hardwood type, and that is sugar maple, American beech, and yellow birch. These are the species that are generally to tolerant of shade. They'll live hundreds of years and usually regenerate in, uh, in gaps. Large diameter is about the same as it's been, which is good in this way. An increase in medium diameter stands and an increase in small diameter stands. These could be stands where the spruce and fir was the major component. The spruce and fir was cut and hardwood remained. And these would be more likely grown up after a clear cut during the spruce bloodworm era, which we had plenty of. So a total gain of about two and a quarter million acres if you interpret that axis here. And then we have the shade intolerant. Those are your aspens and your white birches. And we have a slight increase in the large diameter, a little up and down in the medium, and quite the jump in the small diameter. And this is a slightly different scale here, so this is a, a smaller jump than it looks like relative to itself. But that is most likely going to be driven by the clear cuts of the 1970s and 1980s coming back to sprouts and some blown in birch seeds as well. But aspen, if you have aspen in your stand and you cut it, it likes to sprout from the roots. And if you've ever had an aspen in your yard and cut it down, you've probably experienced that. I've fought that battle myself over the years with a weed whacker in my blueberry patch. But aspen is very good at sprouting and that's part of its life history. So we've had a serious conversion from one forest type to the other. The Warming of the climate does tend to favor hardwood species. We live in what's called the Acadian forest type, which is sort of the blending of the northern boreal forest types, your spruces, your firs, and the temperate hardwood type, which is your sugar maples, your yellow birches, your other species that you find more of down in southern New England. With a warming trend, you expect to see a bit of that, but I expect that the bulk of the change that we see here is in response to the past uh, bud or map break, which shaped a lot of what we see in the woods today. So we're down about one and a half million acres since the 80s. Most, uh, a fair bit of the land has changed hands since then. Great Northern and others, of course, have gone. And we also understand from earlier records, we don't have maps, we don't have as good inventory data, but we note that the conversion from a red spruce dominated forest to a more balsam fir dominated forest started around the turn of the last century, when loggers were preferentially harvesting the spruce because you could do more with it. The balsam fir is generally smaller, there's a piece there, and generally not as good for a variety of products until the paper making industry decided that it was uh, a very suitable material to use and it saw quite a lot of use for that. But the general thrust of our history has been away from red spruce and towards balsam fir and in a conversion from softwood to hardwood through the uh, frankly emergency situation of the last outbreak. So that has reduced the amount of budworm food because the spruce budworm, despite the name, prefers to eat fur. It is a less well-defended foliage. It's more nutritious to it. It doesn't have to deal with as many defensive chemicals. And that, uh, that means that while we have less spruce fur, less host forest type for the budworm to eat, it may be a better blend of food for it in terms of how much spruce and how much fur. Some early estimates from about 102 years ago by our early forest service estimated about 15% of the forest was fir and the balance was uh, spruce and now we're on the order of half and half with some areas more spruce and other areas much more fir. So that's the context that we live in. We have a different forest type than we had in the 1970s and 1980s. Higher risk in some ways, lower risk in other ways and it's essentially a new situation. Among other things, we have drought stress, and there was a time when I would have been laughed out of town for saying the words drought and balsam fir stress in the same sentence, because we've had such consistent precipitation in the state of Maine that it's got the reputation, and I quote, of being the magic forest, where no matter what you do to it, spruce and fir will come back. And come to find out with the stresses of climate. If a tree is, well, let's, let's back up into some of the physiology of balsam fir. Very interesting study done over the course of uh, a decade and a half on the sap flow of uh, balsam fir in the, uh, 
in the context of droughts throughout all the things that experienced over those 15 years. So they put a monitor to measure the sap going up and down the tree, and they correlated that to the vapor pressure deficit, which is essentially humidity with some extra steps thrown in, and also the uh, amount of uh, sunlight the tree was getting. And come to find out those things predicted how much water the uh, tree was moving, and the actual availability of water didn't really change how the tree was acting at all. So the tree was always acting like it had plenty and always trying to keep going. And that is in line with, I like, sort of think of, of balsam fir as a tree that doesn't know when to stop. That when it's got a lot of shade, it doesn't slow down. It keeps on trying to grow in height. Where a red spruce, when you shade it, it sort of sits and stays for a while until something else dies. Balsam fir sort of overexerts itself in that way. So when a drought hits, it keeps on trying to draw water just as much as it always has, which is quite a contrast to our lovely Douglas fir, which is one of the finest trees in the world for a variety of reasons, but among them, it tolerates a drought pretty well. There's varieties and genetics that do better than others. The coastal varieties that have been used to water for all their lives do more poorly. The ones from droughty environments do better, but it, it looks like Balsam fir just doesn't have much of an adaptation to drought because it hasn't experienced it much in its uh, genetic history. Another point here, fine root production, in the same way that trees produce needles and leaves each year, they're also producing fine roots. And fine roots are the ones that do the work of drawing the water up into the tree. And if you have a drought, those fine roots often die off. And it relies on a new flush of those fine roots in the next year to compensate for that loss. If the conditions in the following year are also poor for development, two drought years in a row, you can get some pretty severe stress. And in terms of the cause of death of this tree, we are not 100% certain, and that's just the way it is for a lot of these things, but we had a pretty awful drought in 2020, and the best guess that we have for a lot of this uh, red that we're seeing here, this is absolutely not budworm. There is a bit of budworm in this area. This is my own backyard. But this is more likely an effect of uh, the tree simply running out of water and not being able to replenish its own uh, reserves. But that's not definite. So here is, see if I can not blast this out. Our malaria root disease, and this is from a local Christmas tree plantation. This is a video I made for my uh, forest uh, entomology pathology class. Hello, forest protection class. It's August 8th, and it is time to talk about our malaria. You can see along this row, there's one, two, three, and so just give a nice little push right over, exposing the root system. In the root system, we are looking for these white local mats. That is the diagnostic feature there. Let's see, there's a lot more of it. And we're also looking for the black rising mars. Let's see if we can find that over there. Those rhizomorphs will stay in the ground. 
for quite a long period of time, but if the next generation is established, then it will start climbing up the root until it gets to the tree, where it eventually gurgles around under the bark and ends where it beats. So again, we're looking for the white on the mats and the black slide across the mats. So our malaria root disease, yes? Just pulling it out is going to be the end of it? No. So it's going to reduce. So all of these fungal cables, for lack of a better word, are attached to roots and they're using the energy of that uh, decaying root to grow out into the soil and find more roots to latch onto. So by ripping up that food source, you're removing its energy source, and you're also ripping up some of the uh, structure itself. So here's another one of the shoestrings here in association with that uh, white fungus. Mm -hmm. And this is another one that if I'd said this 15 years ago, people would have Again, kind of laughed a bit. This is a Western issue. There's about 12 different species of our malaria, and one or two of them are really serious pathogens. One of the, uh, the professor who taught me forest pathology, he did a survey up here about 20 years ago, I think, and he found it, but he didn't find it causing any serious issues. And the site that I showed you has a bit of uh, drought stress, and it's got a few generations of Christmas trees in that area behind it. And that cycle is what uh, can give you that issue. But the drought stress is a serious part of that, that when the tree's defenses are weakened by drought stress, the fungus is able to climb up those roots faster faster because the fungus is trying to grow up and the tree is trying to send resins and uh, other things to stop its progress. When it is not able to mobilize a lot of energy because there's a lack of water, then those defenses are weakened and the mushroom is able to climb farther up, that, uh, up the root until it gets to the main trunk and then totally interrupts the movement of uh, sap up the tree. So that is a thing that we see a bit of. And in that stand that we uh, know about, we've, you've seen these mushrooms, right? Mm -hmm. There are edible varieties. I'm not telling you to go eat them because that's not my specialty. People do eat varieties of this. That's an FYI, not an instruction. <laughs> but uh, some people think they're delicious. It's called honey mushrooms. And a lot of them simply focus on wood that's dead already and don't cause a problem. Some of them will kill trees. And that uh, yellow to red progression is typical of our malaria. Again, it's a much more serious thing out west. I've never seen it cause any serious issue in a forestry context, but on a Christmas tree farm in a bit of a droughty situation, it has uh, killed some trees and is behaving as it does in the west, which is interesting, and we may see it. This is not our malaria, and this is also not budworm. This is uh, one of many potential species of uh, brown rot fungus. Without a mushroom, I can't tell you which one. There are a wide variety of things that do this. But this is uh, one of the elements that makes balsam for a bit of an issue to work with. You get about 50 or 60 years with it, and it usually has some form of decay that will uh, compromise the tree itself or its uh, value as wood product. So that's, that's a pretty typical situation. You see that all over the place with 40, 50, 60 year old uh, balsam fir where the spruces are much more tolerant to attack by those fungi. Now let's see how we're doing for time. We're doing all right for time. Bark beetles. We really talked about everything but budworm here, aren't we? I'll give you the context of all the things that budworm interacts with. And back in the day, before a lot of the big spruce was cut out here, spruce beetle was one of the big driving elements of our forest ecology. The bark beetle flies in spring, attacks a tree, lays its eggs in the uh, phloem, eating the cambium and the phloem. And that is the gallery of the adult crawling up the bark. The eggs hatch, the larvae chew outwards, and the blue stain fungi that they brought with them hatch also and clog up the uh, conductive structures of the tree. Eventually the larvae grow, pupate, and the cycle repeats. So there's two things that often set this off. The one is wind throw. When the tree falls over, it's no longer able to mobilize any chemical resin defenses against these beetles. And 
when a few come in, many come out, and then they can attack healthy trees in a way I'll demonstrate with this uh, good friend of mine, mountain pine beetle. How many of you have heard of mountain pine beetle? How many of you have seen uh, pallets of two by four come across with uh, Tolco or Canfor on the label? You see a bit. They, they have a lot of beetle killed wood out there. So Dendroctinus is the genus, Dendroctinus meaning tree killer, and Ponderosa for Ponderosa pine, and it attacks several other species of pine as well. Many of the conifer species have bark beetles specifically adapted to overcoming their defenses. So a balsam bark beetle probably wouldn't go for spruce, a spruce beetle wouldn't go for a pine, a pine beetle did get confused and bite my arm once, but I won't hold that against them. They're about yay size, they're none too smart, but if there's a lot of food in front of them and they happen to hit it, they'll do pretty well. And what happens when one goes in, the tree attempts to defend itself with resin. When successful, this is what it looks like underneath the bark. Here's your beetle whose progress has been arrested by these toxic resins. It has created a resin pocket here, which is a small dead area flooded with resin and it has uh, successfully stopped that beetle. Here's another one, a pitch out. This is where the beetle went in, the tree responded with a lot of resin, and sent it out in a uh, very unhealthy condition out the other end. This is another one, this sort of, see how that's sort of globular, it's, it looks very wet. That's what you want to see after a beetle attack. And over the years, you'll have a healing of that resin pocket and the tree will resume normal function. And you can see the scar in the year that it was formed, which was the basis of my uh, calculation of when outbreaks happened in the past. This is what you don't want to see. This, you see much less globular, much more sawdust. That came out the rear end of the beetle. And every one of these holes is where a beetle went in and is laying its eggs. You can probably see about 50 in there if you count it. So that is a very poorly defended uh, lodgepole pine. If the resin defense fails, one comes in, it digests the resin that was meant to flush it out, makes a slight chemical change, and that chemical out the other end makes an attractive scent to friends. It says, come on in. We're open for business. This tree is not defending itself very well, and you get what's called a mass attack. So that is just one out of the, you saw about 50 on the base of that trunk. And every one of these development chambers here hatches out a beetle. So one goes in and 10 or 20 or 30 come out. The yellow tree is the one that has it. Off they go. And by the time you see red, the beetles are fully mature and gone. So you get used to looking for yellows when you're trying to find these things. So this one has active uh, beetle in it, the red behind last year's. So back in the day, we had an awful lot of spruce beetle here because the spruce beetle prefers the larger trees. We simply don't have so much of the uh, large spruce anymore to support populations of that. Now, what you're seeing here is a map of British Columbia and Maine to scale. The green is pine forest or pine predominant. In here is where I worked, where it's Douglas fir first and pine second. The pink is going to be the attack of the beetle in the year listed. And the white will be where it was in a previous year. In 1999 to 2000, you can see the bark beetle erupting simultaneously throughout the province. You can see just those little fine bits of pink all the way from one end of the thing to the other. This is an area about the size of all of New England here. It expands, it expands, it expands mm -hmm. until by the time we get to 2013 when I was out here taking samples, I looked and I looked and I looked because I needed living pine for my research. I found in three years of field work, three living pine trees over that diameter. It was an incredibly potent outbreak. And unfortunately, the numbers here correspond to the number of uh, wood processing mills within each town. 
and the color codes are the severity of uh, attack by all insects over that time period, which was a pretty devastating thing. So they spent about 20 years chasing dead wood, have since run out, and that's a whole different story. All around, you will be seeing some bark beetles in dead and dying balsam fir. These are usually what we call secondary attacks. The tree was killed by something else, and the beetle said, thank you very much for this undefended food source. I'm going to do a generation here. So every one of these holes was a woodpecker who found himself a meal. I feed the woodpeckers, and it turns out I didn't need to that year. They, uh, they did fine. So all of these holes, they're chasing down beetles that are there opportunistically. They are usually not the ones that kill. I've got a list of about 15 different native bark beetle species that are all generally secondary users of otherwise heavily stressed or killed trees. Sometimes a secondary insect can become a primary. I've seen it where an insect that is known as the secondary pest is actually the one killing the tree, but it's rare. That I don't think that is the cause of death, but you will see it. You'll see the frass, the beetle poop coming out the holes. You'll see woodpeckers going after the beetles. It is not generally the cause of death. Eruptive forest pests with an eye. So eruptive would be a volcano. Eruptive are the ones that can go into a massive population growth like the mountain pine beetle, like the spruce budworm. So this is the usual cycle. Endemic means that it's here. It's within its normal lower population levels. And that is a perfectly fine part of our ecosystem. That you're going to see some maps in the uh, pretty near future where they're down here. We don't care. We're not doing anything about them. This incipient stage is where we can identify rapid growth. This is where we're putting our focus right now. Identifying when it's going from here towards here. Everything that we experienced in the 70s and the 80s was up here. And then 86 collapsed here, goodness gracious, and returned to endemic conditions. And that is a population cycle. And I don't mean to imply any regularity to the cycle. You might have heard, oh, every 30 to 60 years it comes. It's not so predictable as that. That we have tree ring analyses that uh, you can see the reduction in growth from the needles having been chewed off. A range of, I think, 46 to 106 years between outbreaks. It's not like clockwork. It's not really a predictable event. And there's been populations that have come, gone, not really done much, and there's others that have exploded into a regional outbreak. The big one that we know about, well, the first big one, turn of the last century, 1913 to 1919, affected most of the state. And then through the 40s, 50s, 60s, a little bit here and there, a lot of it around Ashland, out to St. Agatha, and this general area here, up and down, up and down, up and down. It's up a bit. What you're seeing here, 10 to 100 to 1,000 times more than we have right now, just to put that into context. But up and down, up and down. These are surveys from the air. And when you can see that much, that's pretty serious. 65, it's bouncing around. It's still there. That's fine. It's bouncing around, bouncing around. 1970, 71, this may be growing, and there may have also been an in-flight from a Quebec outbreak here that caused it to grow into what we understand as the 1970s outbreak. But you can see how difficult it is to assign a start date to that when there was a massive increase in population levels, but it's not like we didn't have a bit going on before. And a large part of the reason why we have such a massive population growth is that there was a food source there to support it. There was a huge generation of balsam fir growing up after the first round of logging in the state of Maine and the fires that we had. And all of that tended to favor balsam fir. And that was all coming to maturity in the 1970s and the 1980s. And with all that mature fir, that's an excellent food source for the budworm. And it took good advantage of that. There was a much larger outbreak in Canada going on at that time. And there were some pretty huge efforts, at first led by the state, and then moved on to the shoulders of the uh, individual landowners to have what's called foliage protection spray. 
And throughout the 70s and the 80s, that was the main goal, to keep the trees alive during that epidemic outbreak stage. So you might have seen some recent articles about the uh, old airport and how that was used for the spruce butterworm spray. That was less an effort to adjust the course of the population as to keep trees alive during it. That once that horse is out of the barn, it's pretty well going, and your hopes of adjusting the course of that population without good data on what's coming in the following year. When you're basing on defoliation, you're basing on last year's activities. It's pretty hard to do anything about that. But you can keep trees alive, and that was the goal for most of what, uh, what we saw there. The cutting, obviously, yes. How does the protection spray work? We are going to get to that in a okay. few slides here. So the uh, cutting during that time, heavy, very heavy. We didn't know really what would live and what would die. And a lot of places acted on the assumption that it would die. There were a few, Baskahegan and Baxter State Park come to mind, who made the bet that the red spruce would make it through. And a lot of it did, some of it didn't. But they've got a pretty good supply of the bigger spruce in this day and age, where a lot of the salvage and pre-salvage logging done throughout the state of Maine made the assumption that the red spruce would not make it through. And when everything is red, that's, you know, there's an argument for that. But what we saw was essentially the turning point of Maine forestry history, where a lot of attention was placed on the forest industry that hadn't been there before. A lot of attention towards uh, clear cutting because the rolling clear cuts of that era, thousands of acres, it gets the attention. That led to the Forest Practices Act, that led to a failed referendum against clear cutting in 96. This was the origin of a lot of the stands that we see today and the origin of a lot of the conversations that we have around forestry again to this day. So the Forest Practices Act, the limitation on the size of clear cutting, and that also, that whole event led to the divestment of a lot of, uh, a lot of land from mills. So vertically integrated companies used to be more common in the state of Maine, where Great Northern owned about 2.2 million acres thereabouts. About half went to Plum Creek, which became Weyerhaeuser, right? And about half went to Irving after that uh, breakup and divestment. So the mill was sold to one, the land was sold to two others. And there were other, I don't want to say smaller, but everybody's smaller than Great Northern was. So a lot of land changed hands during and after this event. This was the turning point in a lot of Maine history. The scale of the program, foliage protection. So the idea at the time was to kill the bug. The bug is eating the needles. If we kill the bug, the needles are uh, preserved for a year or two, and that is enough to keep the tree alive. In a lot of cases, it was. But this was using broad spectrum chemical insecticides that would kill whatever insect it landed on. Many of them were contact insecticides, meaning they don't have to be consumed. Whatever it touches is affected. And it was done with a lot of World War II surplus equipment. This was before the days of GPS. This was the day before the days of computer systems. This was a lot of World War II equipment following itself around the North Main Woods, spraying at first DDT, then carburetor products, things that we would be hesitant to use at scale today, some things that are no longer on the market today because of human health effects. So this was widespread, about 2 million acres more than once and with some regularity, and about 5 million acres sprayed at least once. There's some very good photos. I can't use many of them because they're behind uh, paywalls by uh, news services. But this was a big event. There's a very nice retrospective that you can find on YouTube that's linked here that we don't have time for. But it goes over the memories of a lot of folks who were involved at the time. Or you might have uh, seen that before. But it's a, it's a very nice little documentary recording their recollections of that time. And this is a slide I stole from another one of my own lectures, but uh, you can see one, two, three planes going across with, uh, it's essentially a follow the leader type operation. They would take off, you'd have your spotter plane, and the others would follow behind, and shutting off for water was not 
really a practical part of that equation. So it was, it was broad strokes at that time with pretty heavy duty products. Now, bringing us into the modern era, this footage is all my own from the past uh, year or two with uh, my voiceover to uh, show people how to find the budworm at lower population levels. And the object of the game for us at this point is to identify populations when they are small and identify those populations that are likely to increase. If they're small and likely to stay small, we don't care. The ones that are small but fierce and likely to grow and contribute uh, population to other areas, those are the ones we want to know about. Bruce Budworm Mark, and Nanjing on Halston Park, White, Norway, Red, and Black Spurs. Early in the season, you might find budworm in our webs around pollen colonies, which are a preferred food source. When the buds have broken, look the new branch tips that are cooked now form or stuck together. The larvae web branch tips together for protection from predators and will defend their spot against other budworms. You can often find larvae that look for these unusual branch tips on seedlings and saplings at roadside. Expect to find more larvae higher in the canopy including trees that have fallen over after the eggs were laid last August. This is why branches are collected from the mid canopy for L2 samples. The spruce bloodworm has a dull green-brown body, a black head, and four white dots for body segment. L3 through L6 larvae are generally similar, except in size. A common species you may find feeding in the same way as spruce coneworm, which has lines running the length of its body. Several other species also feed in the same way, but are generally not as common. Spruce budworm are not social animals, and they do not share branch tips as soft by larvae do. Keep an eye out for budworm on understory trees, where they may have spun down, or fallen when disturbed by a predator or a feeding larva. Defoliation of current ear needles is not easily seen from the air, but can be observed from the ground. This is a relatively high level of defoliation from a current hotspot. If you find trees like this, please communicate their location to the main forest service or Neil Thompson at CFRU. Back feeding on older needles occurs at higher population levels that haven't occurred in Maine since the 1980s. I had to say that. As you have contributed to with the L2 branch collections and pheromone traps and detect rising populations years before an aerial survey would detect the problem. Ground reports can be a valuable addition to these surveys. Spruce bloodworm larvae feed in May and June Keep bait near their feeding location in June and July. Emerge, fly, and lay eggs in July and August. Hatch as L1 larvae in August, and overwinter in an unfed condition. So one more video before we talk more about that. Do you all remember the hard frost that we had? I think it was June the 1st of 2020. I remember it well because I was in a tent at the time and it made an impression. <laughs> But we had a nice little back-to-back -back event where the fresh buds on the balsam fir were just out and we had a hard frost. I think it was down to 26 degrees in places. And then within a month we had heat damage. It was 90, 95 degrees. It was quite a year. So we have all three things going on at once here and we'll take you through what each one of them looks like. Good morning, Forest Protection. It is July 1. We're in Allagash and we're looking at some examples of freeze damage heat damage, and some typical feeding which you would expect to see from budworm. On these samples, we don't have budworm itself, so we can't say that it was budworm, but this is what you would expect to see. So, freeze damage. On June 1, we had a severe freeze, so more than frost, an actual freeze down 25 degrees where I was camping out, it was cold. And you see how the buds are killed back, they were just emerging and they were entirely killed. And this is the same year's bud that escaped. So this is what we're calling freeze damage. In contrast, we have what we're calling heat damage here. And you see how it's just the first half of that foliage. If you look at the back, if you look closely, there's no biological signs here. There's no insect, there's no evidence of a fungus. It's just dead back there. Whether that's heat or drought or both, can't say 100%, but that is what you're seeing a lot of red in the North Main woods. So as you're driving along, you see red trees where it's just the tips and mostly at the top. 
that's what it's going to look like when you pull the branch down and we're assigning that to a combination of heat and drought. Contrast with the feeding that would be typical of work. These were webbed together and you can see the missing needles here. You see there's no bread here. So with a trained eye and binoculars, you can look up and see. Enough of him. So that's uh, one of those things. They look so similar, especially from a distance, especially if it pulled the branches down, that if you just looked for red tips in that year, you would have panicked. And that's why we look closely. That identification is the first step in anything, and that's, uh, that's what we put a lot of our time and effort into. So to review the life cycle, the object of the game is for the budworm to overwinter, and when the buds just start, first start to swell in spring, they actually burrow or mine into them. And as that bud is just opening up, it's eating it from the inside out. And as the buds open up and the needles spread out, they have to work harder to get their food, but they're bigger at that time, so they are able to do that. June and July, you see the pupation. July and August, you see the moth. And you'll see them around uh, light sources quite a lot because they're attracted to light, light like uh, many moths are. So these next few slides are one is budworm and the other is not. This is the spruce coneworm, not budworm, fur coneworm, yellow-headed spruce sawfly, very creatively named. And these ones will all sort of mob up on a branch together. And they usually affect uh, young trees and just a bit of them. Not really a concern. This one, if you have uh, apples. You see that one in your uh, orchard this year, Laura? Well, I hope they don't make their way. They're a pain. This one is uh, the close cousin of spruce butterm. It's essentially a, a lighter green version that will eat hardwoods too. And it particularly likes apples. And you'll find them rolling leaves up. So a leaf roller, very creatively named for very but they'll also get the, uh, the spruce and the fur. So you'll find them feeding in the same place at the same time in the same way, but they are not the one that really goes into a massive outbreak in the spruce fir forests. Apple orchards, these will go into an outbreak and you have an issue with them. But these ones with the four dots on the body, that's from below, that's from the side, that is how you find them. And it's always with those four dots per body segment, never the horizontal lines. Nowadays, you see so many more of those than the others that you don't really have to think too hard about it. These slides, these are, this is a bud where I'm about to pupate in the pupa situation. And all of these, uh, just a heads up, these do wriggle if you find one. Don't be too alarmed. And then budworm moth, budworm moth, Budworm moth. Budworm moth, about the size of my uh, pinky fingernail. They're about yay big. And those will uh, fly locally, lay their eggs, and they'll also uh, catch a, uh, a bit of wind, and they can go hundreds of miles on a, uh, on a good storm. They actually have the ability to detect when a, uh, a front is coming through and will sometimes fly up in advance of a storm that's going to move them great distances, which works great when you're going from Alberta to Saskatchewan or Saskatchewan to Ontario. It doesn't work very well by the time you get to Newfoundland. It worked all those steps up there and then you end up on the Flemish cap and there's no spruce on the Flemish cap. Adaptive until it isn't. On the left are not budworm egg masses, on the right are. These are the pollen cones. That is a preferred food source of the budworm and can contribute to its development. That's a gall in the needle. That's not an egg. This is also a gall. There's a spider egg mass, and I believe these are also spider eggs, but I could be wrong on that. This is a healthy egg mass. This is a dead parasitized egg mass, black, so that sort of whitish green. That one's healthy. That one's parasitized and dead, parasitized and dead, and that one has hatched. So this one has actually contributed larvae to the population. Those other three black ones have not. So we, we hope for whatever parasite is uh, affecting those to do well. The L2 stage is awfully small. You can't see it without uh, first isolating the thing. And we've built the whole lab at UMaine for that process, but that's another story. A variety of predators, pathogens, and parasites will attack the uh, budworm. This one sickly in its own right, this one healthy. Maybe a viral, maybe something else. The head, bigger than the body, that's not a very healthy budworm. This one may be viral, 
but these would take uh, a little more analysis to nail down an exact cause, but all of those are dead of natural causes. We hope to see a lot more of those. So here's our Quebec outbreak. Starting around 2006, they had a, the beginnings of what is now a serious and ongoing outbreak at a scale and intensity similar to what we saw in the 1970s and 1980s. And in 2012, that's where it's at, crossing more into the gas bay as we move forward here. And 2014, this is the year that New Brunswick started its uh, government-funded early intervention strategy, which is essentially looking for hot spots thrown off by moths flying from this Quebec outbreak along this leading edge, finding them and treating them with a bacterial or a molting hormone insecticide to knock them back and hopefully keep them from contributing to an outbreak in that province. More on that to come. 2015, 16, advance, 17, retreat in 2018, thankfully. 2019, no data in the places that say no data, so don't get too hopeful about those. 2020, and here into the main data and what we're doing to keep an eye on it and what we're doing to uh, respond to it. The Maine Forest Service has pheromone traps which are attractive to the, attractive to the male and that gives a early indication of the count of how many moths are flying around. And in 2019, this is quite the spike that we had. The reason why, on the 15th and the 20th of July, we have moths flying from the Quebec outbreak into the state of Maine here and across here, unfortunately landing right on our heads here and affecting both the forests and some Christmas tree plantations in that area. So the Canadians provide us with flight models and we'll breeze through that. Thankfully, 2019 didn't contribute any more than we had before. A slight reduction in the pheromone trap counts. And by 2021, we have a more localized situation with generally reduced trap counts, but we do have a few specific spots that have been uh, up. So what I organize here and with the help of my students is what's called the L2 survey. The L2 is the overwintering stage of the larva, which is waiting to feed in the spring. And that is the stage that gives you the best forecast of the next year's population. By studying the uh, Quebec outbreak and its development since 2006, the Canadians have identified a threshold of six to seven L2 per branch as the threshold of where it's likely to grow into a larger population, expand and contribute moths to other locations. Less than that is uh, below the threshold and sort of in the endemic category. So we send foresters to each of about 300 sample locations since 2014 in our monitoring network. We search for the larvae and the idea is to give the very early warning years in advance of what uh, would be detected in an aerial survey and identify when they're going across this eruption threshold and act immediately to bring it back down below that threshold, ignoring anything that's below it on itself. So New Brunswick, uh, with, uh, really driven by the government, has developed the early intervention strategy, which we'll get to momentarily. So here's the results, my own maps, which these dots may be a bit small on the screen. 2019, a bit here, up to four per branch, nothing over the threshold, very good. Unfortunately, 7.66 at Cross Lake here. And that is what developed into the population and the response that we had this past year. So the way that New Brunswick responds, and that link goes to a YouTube site where they have a whole uh, webinar on early intervention strategy describing how that works in Atlantic Canada, it's beyond just New Brunswick now. But the first thing they do is when they see a hot spot, try to enrich that data set to find the boundaries of whatever's going on. And then interpolation means an estimation of between your sample points, what population do you expect to have based on all of the points around it. And then find out where they're above three and a half per branch because you're estimating between these points and you need to have a threshold to act upon. It is funded by both the uh, federal and the provincial budgets. 17 million for the first uh, four to five years and 75 through 2023. 
And they call it a uh, $300 million solution to a $15 billion problem. Because if the outbreak gets out of hand, the costs of foliage protection are extremely high, especially with bacterial insecticides that are more uh, acceptable in the modern era. Estimating $2 billion in their province if it got to uh, that level. So they're using a bacterial and molting hormone. And because it's a pretty even mix of public and private land, if it's private land, by default it is sprayed, but the landowner can opt out if they choose. And they are given that option each, uh, each year. But the, uh, the product used in New Brunswick is uh, Bacillus thuringiensis variety Christaki, which is a soil-derived bacterial. It was first isolated in the, uh, around the turn of the last century and was used uh, in agriculture starting in the 1950s. This is one that's used in both uh, conventional and organic agriculture. We have about 50 years of experience with it with spruce budworm. It was developed specifically for budworm in the context of the last budworm outbreak where there was, I think, very justified uh, questioning of the broad spectrum chemical insecticides. And the way that this works is particular to the uh, gut chemistry and uh, some of the blah, specific functions of a caterpillar's stomach. So instead of being a contact insecticide which kills what it touches, it is one that has to be consumed and reach the high pH of a caterpillar's stomach and then the, uh, the toxic bit fits like a lock and key into a receptor site in the cell wall of the stomach, which causes it to rupture and the unfortunate larva turns to goo. And guess who gets to count the gooey larva? So it's been used extensively in both agriculture and forestry contexts. And the, uh, the Canadians had an experience in the capital city of British Columbia with gypsy moth, which has been recently renamed spongy moth, which is appropriate, different story. But they sprayed very nearly up to the capital building steps to control that uh, invasive insect. And Health Canada did a pretty comprehensive job of looking at the human effects of that. And those were found to be none, which is in line with all the laboratory tests we have for that. We've fed it in extreme quantities to a variety of animals. We've sprayed over the top of a lot of uh, suburban areas with this product. And you may have also heard of BTI, Bacillus thuringiensis variety israelensis, which is used in mosquito control programs pretty extensively. So it's one that we're fairly comfortable with. The tebufenicide molting hormone mimic is strictly speaking a chemical insecticide because it is a chemical product. BT is similarly brewed to a beer, that vats of it are grown and fed, it's a, a living thing. Tebufenicide is newer on the market. We don't know it as well. I don't think we're going to see that in Maine in the near future, even though it is cheaper. But we have such a long history with BTK that we're, that's generally a more known known, even though the other one does seem to have a very good profile. So the long-term monitoring plots at Cross Lake here, 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 and here, this is the one that picked up above seven. And J.D. Irving drew the short straw for where the, uh, the bugs landed in 2019. So this is all on them. And I directed this follow-up survey to sort of get the boundaries on that. Because if you just went with what the algorithm gave you for spray based on this, you'd have about 20,000 acres. With the follow-up survey, I knocked that down to about five. And that is a big part of my job to do those surveys lay out to constrain, constrain, constrain. We want to use as little as possible. I don't want to see an inch done more than has to be done to keep an outbreak from occurring. Even though it is a very benign product in terms of human effects, it doesn't kill the beneficial insects that eat the budworm themselves. Whatever caterpillar eats it, is feeding at that time, will be killed. I've loved caterpillars since I was a kid. Minimal side effects, whatever you can do to minimize, 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 minimize. That's my primary role in this, to constrain, constrain, constrain. So originally, about 20,000 acres. This is from the Maine Forest Service 2021 report. After excluding some hardwood forests, that of course, budworm is a uh, conifer species, and some wet areas, budworm doesn't like to live in swamps. And that ended up being about 5,000 acres that was treated with the BTK. Those of you who are familiar with Cross Lake here know that there are camps all along there. 
And the first thing we did was talk to the friends across the lake who were wonderful. In their, uh, in their communications, we had some uh, meetings with them to talk about what the plan was, what they were going to do. And everything went as perfect as perfect could do. It was the hardest spot that we could have picked, that the bug could have picked for us to do a treatment because it was right up against all those neighbors. There was a uh, buffer placed upon the back end of those camp lots and 250 feet beyond that as a no spray zone. For whenever they were applying, I stood within that buffer. I marked where it was going to be or where it should be. GPS uh, guided helicopter is a little different from a World War II bomber. So I stood within that place every time it went by and it went right where it belonged. So there were people asleep in their camps at four in the morning and myself, <laughs> exactly where it was supposed to be. And I did that one out of curiosity and two when somebody asks me, did it stay where it belonged? I can tell them yes with honesty that it went where it belonged. So that, uh, that seems to have worked quite well, that we went from about 28 larvae per branch in the hottest spot down to about one. Eradication is never a goal with an insect. You can't do it. That if you ask somebody in 1955 with DDT, they might have thought otherwise. Wiping them out is never on the table. It is reduction to the point where the natural predators, parasites, and pathogens can keep things in check. Last slide here before I wrap up. I'm a few minutes over. We have two issues going on here. One, Irving drew the short straw and got the biggest population. But a number of small woodlot owners did too. And that's throughout the St. John Valley. You might have seen a bit of reddening in June and July this year, including right here on uh, Main Street, that we had a bit of defoliation in places that we couldn't really do anything about. One, we didn't know they were there until we saw them after the feeding. That's one of them. That's characteristic budworm feeling, eating. That's about as bad as it's been since 1986. Not a huge stand. About three acres like that. I think they may have all coalesced from an area. This year, we, uh, we collected some branches from there and didn't find too many on there. I think we're going to be okay on that spot, but it's been bouncing around in the valley and we're going to keep a closer eye on it now that we know that it's bouncing around there. On Christmas tree farms, of course, it's a very deeply aesthetic product. Having the needles chewed off your Christmas tree when it comes to your house is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. So the Christmas tree farmers, of course, respond immediately. Some of them have used BTK, some of them have used Carbaryl. That's a conversation to have with a professional that you work with. Carbaryl is old school. It's what we used in the 70s. It's still available as a generic. BTK is more the uh, modern product. But you can understand the, the need to protect that, uh, that resource. That's, that's their livelihood and income. That this is where I think Christmas tree farmers and foresters need to communicate. And I think we've been doing that recently. That I think that that is one of the core pieces of communication because we're, we're dealing with the same insect here. And we're looking at it a different way. We don't really care how it looks in forestry. That if a few needles are chewed off, but the birds are fat and happy, that's fine by us. But for a Christmas tree farmer, that's a tree you can't sell this year. Maybe not even next year. Now that is a pretty serious problem for them. Wrap up slide. Why is this fir tree red, Neil? Hmm. Quick answer, I'd be happy to come out and take a look. That Joe Byther and myself both come out and do house calls and diagnose and say, this is budworm or this is not budworm. Joe Byther has uh, been a senior entomology technician for the Forest Service for some time. It's fantastic. So if you're seeing some missing needles on the tips, a bit of a reddish tinge, that's a pretty good chance that's a budworm. If the whole tree is turned red, that's not budworm. There might be budworm somewhere in there, but that is not the cause of the whole tree turning red like a candlestick. That could be drought alone, that could be our malaria. Brown rots, if the tree is simply snapped off at or near the base, that's a completely different thing. Bark beetles, unlikely to be the true cause of death, but possible. I don't want to rule that out because it'll come back in five years and somebody will have a tree that uh, was killed by a bark beetle. It would be unusual and I'd love to hear about it. 
There are several other moths that you'll see flying around, usually not at the levels that you'll find budworm. The heat stress and frost kill are curiosities that you may see again, and that's why we have to look very closely. I can't just roll up to a tree and say, that's a bit red. It's got budworm. I've, I've got to see the insect. That's the step of diagnosis that, one, to know what we've got, and two, that you don't respond inappropriately with spraying something on something that was just damaged by frost or heat. So diagnosis, then counting, and then getting to decide what you do. So we are in a bit of a situation with budworm. We could receive another in-flight from Quebec next year that gives us a thousand times what we have right now, or we could have none whatsoever. We hope that the trend is downwards. We've generally seen a reduction except for a few very small spots, and the hope is to prevent any of those spots from growing into anything that would cause us serious issues in the woods. I'm five minutes, six minutes, seven minutes over, but I'm happy to take questions. Laura. What types of stands did they attack at Cross Lake? Were they mature stands or plantations or what was? It? They were everything. And what was really surprising to me was even the planted black spruce. Mm -hmm. So black spruce was practically invulnerable in the last outbreak. There's a number of reasons why. Some of that has to do with uh, the temperature and when the buds open up. So the ideal situation for budworm is to come out two weeks before the buds start to swell and open up. And that depends on temperature and light for the tree and temperature alone for the bug. If those things don't line up, the bug can even starve to death or have reduced growth because it comes out too late. Black spruce was generally breaking three or four weeks after the larvae emerged during the 1970s and 80s. And it was considered to be an invulnerable species because of that. With the shift in temperature we've seen, we're seeing faster emergence. And I found budworm larvae very happily growing to maturity inside of black spruce. Does that mean it's going to be a source? We don't know. It's so new mm -hmm. that this behavior is just not something that we have any experience with. One more thing to keep an eye on, but the answer is all of the above that that's one of the key differences between foliage protection and early intervention. Early intervention is looking at the population no matter what it's on, whether it's new seedlings, which are probably not going to die, or a mature forest, which would be more vulnerable. With foliage protection, you're looking at, is this stand high risk? Is it likely to be damaged, killed? Is it something that we need to grow another 15 years and it can't die now? All of those things are immaterial to early intervention, that it's all about where the population is and where that population is likely to grow. Were they in mixed wood stands? There was a bit there too, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, when, when, um, in clear cuts, mm -hmm. uh, up in the North Main Woods area, mm -hmm. when they make announcements and you see signs, spring will be taking place, mm -hmm. uh, what, what are we? What are the, what's, What are we expecting there? This. So, if you're seeing signs saying spraying will be taking place, that's herbicide. Okay. Totally different story. Nothing to do with uh, anything here. So, yes, if it's clear cut budworm, one isn't going to be in it. Yeah. And two, that's a different product, different goal, different uh, different objective. Yeah. Yes, sir. Good. This, the, uh, the work that was done on the west side of Cross Lake, mm -hmm. um, there's a cut going all the way down in the whole east mm -hmm. side of Cross Lake as well right now. They're doing some work is, out there. Is, there. is that just general maintenance or is that preventative or, or have anything to do with the outbreak on the west side? So. I'm not involved with that, so I'm estimating and guesstimating based on what I see, and I would guess yes, that we've seen some budworm population bouncing around before 2019 in that area. Mm -hmm. And it's a really tricky spot to be, of course, because everybody sees it. Your options are either leave it alone, or once it gets into the really tall, skinny condition it's in, it's really tricky to work with. Mm -hmm. So I would guess that that is a sort of host reduction sanitation approach 
And I just drove by 161 on the left. You see the very recent thinning just after you get past the farm fields. What was interesting to me is I, I'm looking at that. They're pretty tall and skinny trees. Wind throw is a risk there. But then as I drive farther down that road, I look to the left and I see a few taller trees above the main cohort there as well. So it may be that they've done the similar sort of thing there in the not so distant past and that is just part of a, a cycle that they do in the visual areas. So the answer is maybe. That it, it does make sense when you have a population of budworm in an area to reduce the uh, amount of food for it. So I'm guessing that's part of their logic. But it may also just be we're working in this area and this is what we do when we're in a, uh, a visual area along this road. Questions? Yes, ma'am. The bacteria spray that was, mm -hmm. the bacteria, was, was that genetically engineered? No, that was found and pretty well brewed in the tank. That, I'm trying to think if you could. I don't know enough about bacteria to say if you could or not, but this one was essentially found, tested against uh, things, and then reproduced. And the, uh, what's the other one? Carbaryl? Carbaryl, yes. How does that work? Um, that is a question for somebody much smarter than me in terms of the actual chemistry, but it's a, a contact insecticide that will, uh, I presume, penetrate through the, uh, the body of the insect. If anybody knows better, please speak up. But it is a, a broad spectrum, meaning it affects many kinds of insects as opposed to just caterpillars. Okay, so it doesn't target it. Okay. No, not, not really targeted at all. Okay. An interesting oops that the uh, Forest Service did in 1957 was uh, they had western spruce budworm and sprayed, I think it was DDT, which is another contact broad spectrum insecticide, common at the time. And it kills anything with six legs. Well, come to find out there's things with six legs that eat spider mites, which have eight legs. DDT does not kill spiders. So spider mites have uh, sort of sucking like an aphid. And uh, after spraying for the budworm so the trees wouldn't turn red, the spider mite turned the trees red. So that's why you don't want to kill your beneficial insects. Yeah. Yeah. They're your friends. They're helping. They're doing most of the work here that when you're making an application in EIS, you're understanding that the, the natural predators, parasites, and pathogens are doing 80, 90% of your work. You're trying to add just that little bit more so you don't have more going into spread into other areas. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Laura? Um, is carbaryl the same as seven? That is an interesting question. It was for a long time up until very recently. Okay. They changed the formulation to something I have no familiarity with. I think due to human health concerns. That they still use carbaryl as a generic in some situations where humans generally aren't. Okay. But if you're giving something to whatever customer walks into tractor supply, well, it, you, you can't assume a uniform level of caution among all customers. Very <laughs> said. Thank you. <laughs> going once, going twice. You can ask more than one. You're more talkative than my usual class. Well. Thank you all for coming. Feel free to uh, check out the old uh, cookie here.